<clears throat> yeah, last week we were talking about how, for example, people before the plague were sort of running mechanically, but they get to that point also during the plague where they're behaving almost as automatons. Um, and in this session, well, okay, let's get started. <coughs> we see a similar sort of parallel being drawn in the behavior of uh, Rambert, Ryu, and Grand, but we'll get to that in just a second. <coughs> First, there's the fact of Monsieur Othon, who gets released from quarantine and <clears throat> immediately says, you know what, I don't think I'm going to uh, leave quarantine. He has fully embraced the solidarity that he's found with the people in the quarantine camp. So he immediately arranges to go back. Um, I don't think I included it in the notes this week, but it bears mentioning that he does not survive. Uh, he's one of the unlucky ones who uh, is one of the last fatalities or he's among the final fatalities of the plague. Um, but uh, we find Rambert encouraging Ryu to write to his wife. Um, hang on, let me get my little pointer. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, so yeah, Rambert using his usual criminal connections uh, has been sending out letters <clears throat> to his wife and receiving answers. Uh, he suggests to Ryu that, that Ryu should write, write to his wife as well through these clandestine channels. And Ryu agrees. Uh, so the way that this is put, he found writing a laborious business uh, as if he were manipulating a language that he'd forgotten. The letter was dispatched. The reply was slow in coming. So it's one thing to uh, notice that it was hard for him, but easy for Rambert. Uh, Rambert is, uh, I don't know. He's definitely changed, but communication with his wife still comes relatively easy, comes easily to him. Uh, and the answers come somewhat easily too. Now, that should, okay, the ease of the response is not anything to do with the characters themselves. But it's just, do you know what I mean by that? So like Rambert writes the letters and gets responses. Ryu writes letters. Oh, I think this is the other TOEFL joining. Let me just check here. Hi, Katarina. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Let me just check something here really quick. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, she actually ended up in the wrong place. Okay. She's headed off to the TOEFL room. Sorry about that. All right, let's get back to this. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, um, Ryu writes letters. No, sorry, Rambert writes letters, gets responses now and then. <clears throat> the ease of writing the letter is there for Rambert, but the ease of receiving the letter is also there. <laughs> um, those are circumstances beyond Rambert's control. Ryu has a hard time writing the letter and also the reply was slow in coming, which is not his fault, but it's still sort of a part of the package. <laughs> uh, communication is hard for Ryu. Um, this is gonna come up again later. For example, when he talks to his mother, we get this little bit of information about how they'd never really told each other that they love each other, but they know. And that's so Ryu, you know, he, uh, He's not concerned about trying to put things into words. <clears throat> People ask him about his motivations and 
other things. And he says, I don't know, there are things to do. Um, but yeah, he's, you know, trying to get back into that frame of mind where he's thinking of his wife as someone with whom he can communicate and he has a hard time. Uh, their exile has been really almost like to another country <laughs> that speaks a different language. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello. Are you here for to Are you here for TOEFL or? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, I'm sorry for being. I'm no, that's, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, I'm sending you to the TOEFL room. Just one sec. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Okay, there we go. That's all the TOEFL people for sure. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Stefan, in case you haven't figured it out, we're in the lobby right now. <laughs> if this were an office building, we're sitting in the lobby having our reading group and people are coming through and I'm directing them to the right room. <laughs> yes, I understand. Okay. Um, what was that? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody playing a heavy metal guitar. Yeah. Um, so, okay, onward. Uh, poor Grand. He goes missing. Uh, people say that they've seen him around, so they go searching for him. <clears throat> and he's just kind of wandering a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit crazy. I don't know, a little bit out of his wits. Uh, when they find him, he's looking through a shop window and you get this real impression of somebody uh, longing for what should be, this is around Christmas, by the way. So, you know, looking through the shop window, uh, with the you know tears streaming down his cheeks, which of course uh, makes Ryu also feel that you know flood of empathy for Grand. Um, but yes, it turns out that Grand <clears throat> has gotten sick. Uh, Ryu looks after him at, at Grand's place, and even in the depth of his illness, Grand is still obsessed with his manuscript, which is the one sentence that he uh, is constantly thinking about and, and working on. But we also see at the bottom of one of the pages that he's been thinking about writing to Jean or Jeannie, I guess. Um, there were some 50 pages of manuscript. Glancing through them, Ryu saw that the bulk of the writing consisted of the same sentence written again and again with small variants, simplifications, or elaborations. Persistently, the month of May, the lady on horseback, the avenues of the bois recurred, regrouped in different patterns. There were, besides, explanatory notes, some exceedingly long. That's kind of funny because he's having a really hard time writing, but he's writing really long explanations for the sentence. <laughs> uh, the explanations could perhaps be transformed into, I don't know, the book that he's working on <laughs> eventually. Just like one sentence on a page and then a line and then just all footnotes after that <laughs> for the rest of the page. Um, and the one sentence is full of <laughs> little uh, numbers you know, for the footnotes. <laughs> it's like 10 of them. Um, so yes, he has these exceedingly long uh, explanations, explanatory notes. That the foot of the last page was written in a studiously clear hand. My dearest Jean, today is Christmas Day and dot, dot, dot. As usual, words fail him, but this is uh, apparently the bane of him. Uh, his lack of communication with his, his wife, his ex-wife. Um, because as we'll see later, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to skip ahead. <laughs> well, you guys have both read it. As we see later, uh, he does communicate with his wife we find out at the very end. And it seems to have had uh, a salutary effect on him. Um, he makes some progress in his sentence. And by progress, I mean he removes a lot of it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to close this. Do you guys, I hope you're not seeing that constant extra box that I have open that shows the rooms. That would be annoying. No. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, yes, uh, Grand, 
even in the depths of his sickness. This is like during the dramatic scene when he's <laughs> gasping. <laughs> when Ryu reads the manuscript, the first thing Gran says is, yes, I know what you're thinking. Huh. And like he should say, I know what you're thinking. This is terrible. You're sick. You're dying. No, he says, I know what you're thinking. Fine isn't the word. <laughs> As if Ryu was, would be thinking about the word fine. Oh, why would you use that adjective? It's, but he insists that his manuscripts be burned. Uh, after the manuscript is burned, Grand recovers. So he has a kind of miraculous recovery. I would say it's a Christmas miracle, but uh, <laughs> Camus certainly doesn't believe in Christmas miracles. Um, <clears throat> and that is the turning point after Grand's recovery. And there's one other patient unnamed a woman who recovers miraculously as Gran does. From that point forward, deaths are on the decline. Things are looking up for old Oran. All right. <clears throat> but that's just as uh, arbitrary, just as absurd as the weather. Uh, so the changes in the plague's behavior gave an impression that its energy was flagging out of exhaustion and exasperation, and it was losing. With its self-command, the ruthless, almost mathematical efficiency that, it, uh, that had been its trump card hitherto. All of a sudden, Castell's injections started working. So for no reason, though. I mean, they were using the injections already. Uh, indeed, all the treatments the doctors had tentatively employed without definite results now seemed almost uniformly efficacious. So for no reason whatsoever, the plague starts to decline and all of these measures begin to work just like the weather. It comes, it goes, it's doing its thing. Nobody can change it. Um, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. <laughs> these guys were trying to do something about it and apparently started working but even the fact that it started working is completely arbitrary what's a trump card ah trump card it's a picture of donald trump no i'm just kidding trump card is the card that uh beats another card uh -huh, okay right so it's stronger than the other. yeah it's the stronger card exactly okay. it's the the yeah the winning card <laughs> uh Trump can be used as a verb. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds so weird these days. <laughs> to Trump means, to Trump something means to one up it, like to go one more above it. Yeah, um, yeah all of this is heavily ironic if you look at Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> okay, most people, I suppose I should hold back on such statements. Uh, people's uh, reactions to these changes are ironic. So things are getting better. But somehow people wind up uh, all over the place. They fluctuate between optimism and depression. Hence the odd circumstance that several more attempts to escape took place at the very moment when statistics were most encouraging. Uh, from what I understand, this bears out in statistics in the real world that... Uh, prisoners are more likely to try to escape from jail towards the end of a sentence because their excitement overwhelms their common sense. <laughs> um, so this is a, a very true observation about how people uh, behave in the real world. This took the authorities by surprise and apparently the sentries too, since most of the escapists brought it off. That's a little bit concerning if you think about it because the plague hasn't stopped yet, but some people do manage to escape. <laughs> um, so this story could, this, this book could have had a sequel <laughs> in the town uh, next door. Um, the uh, city officially acknowledges the decline. This state of sub subdued yet active ferment prevailed until January 25th. Uh, when the weekly total showed so striking a decline that after consulting the medical board, the authorities announced the epidemic could be re regarded as definitely stemmed. Mm -hmm. So it's official. The people of Iran begin, walk, begin to walk in the streets uh, in celebration. Taru notices something. Uh, 
Um, at one moment, when the cries of exultation in the distance were swelling to a roar, Taru stopped abruptly. A small, sleek form was scampering across along the roadway. A cat, the first cat any of them had seen since the spring. It stopped in the middle of the road, hesitated, licked a paw, and quickly passed it behind its right ear, then started forward again and vanished into the darkness. Taru smiled to himself. The little old man on the balcony would be pleased. <laughs> um, I wonder if the cat was black. It doesn't say. <laughs> yeah. Because as you know, things for Taru take a bit of a turn. Um, but it's funny that his first thought is of the, the man spinning on cats. Well, that yeah. guy will be happy again. <laughs> things are really getting back to normal. <laughs> yeah. By normal, I mean a crazy guy spitting on animals in an alleyway. That's what I mean by normal. <laughs> back to sanity. For them, that is normal. Yeah. Well, I guess Obviously. after after everything else, you would be very happy to see that in yeah. spite of the poor cats. I mean, <clears throat> I'm sure the cats are more annoyed than anything. I mean, the cats are not capable of feeling outrage. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> they would just, you know, I'm sure run away. Um, so, yeah, the spitting man, though, seems to have vanished. So this is, again, we start to get some more from Taru's diary. Um, when Taru goes to his usual observation post for the spitting man at the ritual hour, the shutters stayed closed and never did Taru see them open again. He drew the conclusion that the old fellow was either dead or vexed. Uh, vexed, by the way, means troubled, uh, annoyed. Uh, if vexed, the reason being that he had thought that he was right and the plague had put him in the wrong. <laughs> so what a conundrum. This guy felt like he was doing the right thing, but the plague had put him in the wrong. It's a, kind of an odd way of looking at things. If dead, the question was, as in the case of the old asthmatic, had he been a saint? Again, here's this thing about being a saint. Um, Taru hardly thought so, but he found in the old man's case a pointer. Perhaps he wrote, we can only reach approximations of sainthood. In which case we must make shift, that means make do, uh, with a mild benevolent diabolism. Uh, you might be wondering why he uses the term diabolism. Like uh, that, because I mean, it sounds like devil worship, but it yeah. can mean just bad behavior also. And I think he's specifically just here referring to the act of spitting on uh, helpless animals. Yeah. It's a mild benevolent diabolism, like you're doing bad what things. What means benevolent? I forgot. Benevolent means good-willed. Good-willed, yeah. Yeah. That vol, those vol words, like volunteer, Yeah. Uh, they have to do with will. So also, it, I think that it has some connections with cancer. When you have banning cancer, it's some kind of... Oh, yeah. So you, we, have the, we have the Ben words, benevolent, yeah. beneficiary, benign, uh, benediction, practice. benefit. And then we have the Mal words, malevolent, malicious, malign, yeah. maltretirati. <laughs> uh, those are the bad ones. So malevolent is the opposite with, a, huh. with an ill or evil intent. Um, so then about Qatard. Qatard, <laughs> Qatard's not taking the news well. It's, it's so funny. He, you know, things are getting better. Qatard's like, wait a minute now. We don't know that it's getting better, do we? We don't know for sure. I mean, come on, guys. The universe is unpredictable. Maybe everything will go back to being terrible. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he says, hopefully. You really think it can stop like that all of a sudden? He was skeptical about this, or anyhow professed to be. But the fact that he kept on asking the question seemed to imply he was less sure than he professed to be. From the middle of January, Ryu gave him fairly optimistic answers. Uh, but these were not to Qatar's liking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he doesn't like hearing that things are getting better. I mean, naturally, we've talked about why, but it's just, it's, it's funny. Yeah. Um, it was too soon to say definitely that we were out of the wood. In other words, could, this is, you know, Ryu says, okay, we don't, we're not 100% safe. And Qatar says, in other words, there's no knowing. It may start again at any moment. 
Quite so. <laughs> Just as equally possible, the improvement may speed up. And yeah, he goes about approaching people with this conversation about how things might not get better. <laughs> Yeah. looking for some reinforcement uh it's funny how in the story people are frequently looking for the uh the reactions of others um for example when raymond was going around and really seeming to want someone to try to stop him <clears throat> yes. um Cotard is is going around wanting people to confirm his hopes. <laughs> By hopes, I mean his hope that the, the plague will continue. <laughs> <clears throat> he needs that affirmation. Every morning he wakes up and looks in the mirror and says to himself, the plague will continue. The plague will continue. <laughs> okay, his, that's his daily affirmation. Um, Cotard is approached by two men. Uh, so Katard and Grand are shaking hands. No, Katard and Taru are shaking hands at the door of the apartment where Katard lived. Quite right. Katard was growing more and more excited. That would be great. Starting again with a clean sheet. In his mind, he's thinking of a clean rap sheet. Uh, suddenly, from the lightless hall, two men emerged. Taru had hardly time to hear his companion mutter. Now, what do those birds want? When the men in question, who looked like subordinate government employees in their best clothes, cut in <clears throat> with an inquiry if his name was Cotard. With a stifled exclamation, Cotard sw swung around and dashed off into the darkness. So uh, we can see that authorities are beginning to uh, be restored. Public services like law enforcement are coming back. <clears throat> And sadly enough, this part of the diary represents the end of Teru's diary. As a sort of postscript, and in fact, this is where his diary ends, he noted, there's always a certain hour of the day and of the night when man's courage is at its lowest ebb. And it was that hour only that he feared. Uh, he only feared the hour during which people are afraid. It's the, yeah. there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, what are you afraid of, uh, Taru? I'm afraid of that time of day when I'm afraid. <laughs> That's, it, it's kind of funny way to put it. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that time of day, Taru? Well, the problem with that time of day is I'm afraid during that time of day. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm afraid of it. Um, Taru has contracted the plague at this point. Um, Ryu uh, decides to keep Taru at his place with, uh, with him and his mother, Ryu's mother, to look after him instead of uh, sending him into isolation. So it's another situation where things are unusual. Um, so we remember that Panalu had unusual symptoms that could not be quite placed. Uh, and also refused to be treated. Not that Taru is refusing to be treated, but that uh, his case, Panalu's case was unique. Taru's case is unique. And uh, there are other parallels between Panalu and Taru. They both have ideas about the silence. Do you guys remember? where Panalu says that the silence is the, uh, no, sorry. The truth is the, si okay, <laughs> let me get this straight. Taru says the truth is the silence. Sorry, I'm getting it backwards. Panalu says the truth is the wellspring of life. That's the thing. Uh, they have, uh, they have parallels certainly that are drawn between them repeatedly, and this is another one. They both have unusual symptoms. Um, Taru struggles differently from other patients also, where other patients convulse, uh, thrash around, cry out. Taru concentrates and doesn't move. Um, he doesn't speak. He wants to keep his attention focused uh, not once in the course of the night did he counter the enemy's attacks by restless agitation. 
Only with all his stolid bulk, with silence, did he carry on the fight. Nor did he even try to speak, not oh speak, <laughs> thus intimating after his fashion that he could no longer let his attention stray. So he's staying focused. Um, and yeah, again, it's absurdity. And I can't help but thinking of uh, Camus himself uh, in this. Camus is, you know, another senseless death. It came out of nowhere. Um, and this is, you know, as, as the deaths are declining, uh, Taru <clears throat> may be the last of the deaths. <clears throat> For the first time, the doctor realized that this night, without the clang of ambulances and full of belated wayfarers, was just like a night of the past, a plague-free night. So everything's outside going back to normal. There are cars. <clears throat> there are not constant uh, ambulances. There are people walking around. It was as if the pestilence hounded away by cold, the street lamps and the crowd had fled from the depths of the town and taken shelter in this warm room and was launching its last offensive at Taru. What is pestilence? Pestilence is plague. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, the French name of this book is La Peste. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, pestilence is plague and illness. Uh, okay, Taru, who took the initiative to start the sanitation squads, is among the last deaths. So there's this irony, right? He's the one who wanted to... Well, of course, Ryu was fighting first, but Taru was a person, a civilian, so to speak, who uh, took up the sword to fight against the plague, and he was the first like that. And he's among the last deaths. Ryu and his mother hold vigil over the corpse of Taru. Here's this thing about uh, them not communicating the depth of their feelings for each other. Bernard. Uh, if you don't remember, that's actually Ryu's name. We never say it. <laughs> He's Bernard. <laughs> yeah. His mother says Bernard. Yes. Not too tired. No. This is while they're looking over the corpse. At that moment, he knew what his mother was thinking and that she loved him. But he knew too that, the, uh, that to love someone means relatively little, or rather that love is never strong enough to find the words befitting it. That's an interesting reversal, isn't it? Um, instead of saying that words are never strong enough to express love, uh, it's inverted. Love is never strong enough to find the words befitting it. Thus he and his mother would always love each other silently. And it's different from the struggle of Grand, for example, to try to find words. It seems that Ryu and his mother uh, already know, right? In the same way that Ryu already, okay, he doesn't know. <laughs> he knows without knowing. He knows without knowing to do what he does to treat people the way that he treats people as a doctor. And in the same way, he and his mother know without knowing. Like if you were to ask them, they wouldn't be able to find the words, but they're both, they both live in that reality. They both live in, in that love, right? Uh, do you guys follow me on this? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting way of putting uh, this, this idea. Uh, right after... Taru has passed on. He finally receives, receives word on his wife. Um, it turns out that she, she hasn't survived. Another irony, she escaped the plague at the beginning of the story uh, and died in the sanatorium. Uh, yeah. That no doubt explains Dr. Ryu's composure on receiving next morning the news of his wife's death. He was in surgery. His mother came in, almost running, handed him a telegram, went back to the hall to give, him a telegra to give the telegraph boy a tip. When she returned, her son was holding the telegram open in his hand. She looked at him, but his eyes were resolutely fixed on the window. It was flooded with the effulgence of the morning sun rising above the harbor. So the, 
let's say the brightness, the brightness of the morning sun. Um, he takes it as stoically as ever. Um, at this point, the gates of Iran are opened. There are more celebrations. Everyone goes out into the streets. Um, parted lovers begin to try to find each other. Uh, Rambert goes to the train station. There are lots of people waiting at the train station for their, uh, for their lost loved ones to come into town. Um, there are two groups of separated lovers, the ones who find their other and the others who never will. Um, Rambert is among the first group. Ryu is among the second. You guys remember at the beginning of the story that uh, they wanted to make a new start. We get this impression that maybe they were somewhat estranged from each other. Uh, that maybe they had not been as close as they would like. And, uh, you know, they always believed that they would have a little more time. But the plague is there to remind you that you don't necessarily have time. <laughs> you, need to do th you need to do the things that are important to you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so the people who awaited them at home or on the platform, among the latter, Rambert, whose wife, warned in good time, had got busy at once and was coming by the first train. So she was already on the way. Uh, were likewise fretting with impatience and quivering with anxiety, for even Rambert felt a nervous tremor at the thought he would soon have to confront a love and devotion that the plague months had slowly refined into a pale abstraction. So this is discussed previously that uh, after being worn down, exhausted, and becoming almost a robot, um, that their memory fails them, the parted lovers, eventually they can't remember. Their memory fails them. They can't remember the face. And then their imagination fails them. They can't imagine the face. Uh, they've seen so much and been through so much that they've kind of just been reduced to automatic uh, survival, speaking in stock phrases and all that. Uh, but now he's about to see again uh, his wife as a real flesh and blood woman who had given rise to those feelings. Um, as he meets her, he can hardly break free from the abstraction. So she runs out of the train, throws her arms around him, and he and his around her. Uh, with his arms locked around her, pressing uh, to his shoulder, the head of which he saw only the familiar hair, so he doesn't see her face. <clears throat> he let his tears flow freely, unknowing if they rose from present joy or from sorrow too long repressed. Aware only they would prevent him his making sure if the face buried in the hollow of his shoulder were the face of which he had dreamed so often, or instead a stranger's face. Wow, wouldn't that be embarrassing? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought you were someone else. <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember <laughs> what my wife looks like. All right, sorry to... <laughs> Sorry to make a joke out of this. <laughs> Just occurred to me. I thought you were someone else. By the way, when somebody says to you, I thought you were someone else, the proper response is, I am. <laughs> I am someone else. I'm not you. Um, it's always good to have responses like that at the ready. Um, so yes, he's... Uh, Hugging his wife, can't see her face, and has almost a fear that it won't be her face when she looks up. So many of the lovers will never uh, see each other again. For these last who had now for company only their newborn grief, for those at this moment, uh, those who at this moment were dedicating themselves to a lifelong memory of bereavement for these unhappy people matters 
were very different. Uh, the pangs of separation had touched their climax for the mothers, husband, wives, and lovers who had lost all joy now that the loved one lay under a, uh, a layer of quicklime in a death pit or was a mere handful of indistinctive ashes in a gray mound. The plague had not yet ended. So, I mean, again, this really seems to summon imagery of the, the death camps, the Nazi death camps. I mean, people being burned into a handful of ashes, people being put into giant death pits. Um, you know, it was, not to go too much into that, but uh, at those death camps, it was literally the policy to uh, not let any of the family members know anything about what happened to the person who was taken away. So the person sort of just ceased to exist one day. Uh, and the panicked family members could only call and try to get information about what happened to their loved ones. And the Nazis would not release any information. It was policy literally to sort of leave people uh, wondering, to leave, the, to leave it open-ended. It's horrible. Um, so these people are discovering for the first time that their loved ones didn't make it. Um, and so they have a new kind of plague to deal with. <laughs> their their uh, suffering is sort of just beginning in a way. As the streets fill with bustle and revelry, uh, Ryu has a lonely walk and reflects on the current state of things. Uh, so yeah, he has this sort of slow stroll through town. Um, where he is musing, oh, just a sec. Okay, here we go. Uh, he's musing about everything that's happened. He's musing about the plague. Um, he thinks about how people are already trying to get back to the life that they knew before. It's pretty clear though that nobody will ever be able to really truly be exactly as they were before. And that's a good thing. Um, not that he's pro-plague, but it is mentioned throughout the book that it, uh, and this is a belief shared by Panelu, but in a different light, that the plague kind of wakes people up to, to reality. So they'll never be able to, to really just be like they were before. Uh, they'll certainly mostly, hopefully anyway, we okay, three adverbs at once, uh, appreciate their existence more <laughs> and appreciate their loved ones more. Calmly they denied in the teeth of evidence that we had ever known a crazy world in which men were killed off like flies or that precise savagery, that calculated frenzy of the plague, which instilled an odious freedom as to all that was not the here and now or those charnel house stenches which stupefied whom they did not kill. So, um, I, you know, I always try to put this back into the framework of uh, occupied France. So I imagine, you know, as, uh, as France was liberated, as Paris was liberated, that people wanted to get back to normal. And there's a certain group of people that sort of just deny that any of it ever happened. In fact, a good number of people were just trying to live their life as they had, even during the occupation. Um, they had uh, limited freedom. They had puppet sure. states, which France. Yeah. During no, I know. They had, okay. you know, th I mean, there were curfews. There were checkpoints. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was an observed, <laughs> an observed like freedom in quotes, you know, it wasn't really a yeah. freedom. Like, uh, they had, uh, the half of the France was under German control. And the well, no, half. they extended, the, the Germans extended control to the entirety of France. Yeah. Uh, through their, uh, Pétain or something. Yeah, exactly. Through Pétain. That's right. Yeah. Um, half of the France was annexed in Germany, something like that. 
Yeah, they were trying to. That was a big part of the fighting to begin with. Uh, yeah. These contested lands. Yeah, between... because I think they believed that uh, they deserved the half of the prince for them, something like that. I don't know. Uh, the... Contested lands were certainly a part of the of the the fighting. Yeah, and they also had the interest because you know that the half that half. Uh, had the coast and harbors, and that was important for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. In any case, uh, as the Allies began to liberate France, that's kind of where we're at in the plague, too. <laughs> Except, uh, I don't know, uh, the Allies in this case are <laughs> the people fighting against the plague, um, the people fighting in the resistance, really not really the allied forces. <laughs> the people resisting the plague in, in Iran are more like the resistance, the French resistance, because they live there. Um, and it's funny because uh, there, there's this effort made in the writing to remind us that it's just arbitrary. It's almost like saying as well that <clears throat> the resistance activities of uh, the French underground resistance were you know, it just may or may not be effective. Almost like it doesn't matter. I don't know. But it does matter, obviously. Um, and this part uh, where he says, which instilled an odious freedom as to all that was not the here and now. <clears throat> There's a thing that Sartre says, and I may have mentioned it before. Pardon me if I'm repeating myself. Uh and this is a sentiment that's shared by others in their group, as far as I understand. But he said that during the occupation, we were more free than we had ever been in our lives, which sounds completely counterintuitive. And what he explained it, he explained it by saying that when you went out into the street and you saw the checkpoints and when you saw, you know, Nazis sitting at the cafes in uniform, and you saw guards on the corners, <clears throat> you, were, you had your face shoved into the fact that you, you have to decide what to do. You can't deny it. <clears throat> you can't just, I mean, you can try to pretend you don't see that. Um, so that's what he means by, we were more free than ever before because we're, we have no choice but to look at the, the choice that we must make. And that choice is to, I don't know, resist or just put your head down, put your hands in your pockets and just keep walking. Um, yeah. So you're kind of, you know, reminded of, of the freedom that's always there. The, the concept of freedom for the uh, existentialists is extremely important. Uh, and it's not to be misunderstood as a radical freedom that says you can just do anything you want all the time. It, it's more like... <clears throat> yeah, you're, that's anarchy. Well, this is not a political. Uh, I mean, everything's political, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. this is not a polit this is not a political observation. It's it's a psychological observation that says that you have the choice of how you will interpret your circumstances. Yes, uh, yes, that's agree. that's that's the freedom part, right? So there's the objection, like, well, what if you were, you know, one of those medieval torture chamber prisoners chained to a wall? Well you ha still have the kind of freedom to decide how you're going to deal with that and how you're going to interpret it. Yeah. And like your internal uh, position towards your circumstances is something that you do have influence over. Okay, but that we're kind of sidetracking a bit. Let's get back to the story. We'll talk about that stuff more though. I'm thinking in the final section, we're gonna include more discussions about philosophy and maybe some other authors. I haven't totally decided yet. <laughs> I would like for you guys to be a part of that decision. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's, it's a little bit hard to connect uh, philosophy and those ideas with plague and, you know. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> because, I mean, they want to say that this is what it, what it is all the time. You know, that's actually what's going 
and this there's going to be a discussion coming up here with <clears throat> with the Spaniard. Yeah. Where he actually has a pretty good insight where he says, what do they mean plague? It's just life. <laughs> that's that's literally just life, yeah. you know. It's always there. <clears throat> it's kind of like I don't remember who said this, but uh, life is a disease with a bad prognosis because the outcome is always fatal. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a very dark way of putting it, but it's kind of what he's getting at. Okay, so here's uh, Ryu musing, chewing over, ruminating on uh, the nature of their exile. He has this thing that he keeps bringing up uh, about being banished from a distant homeland, but that distant homeland <coughs> is not literal uh, necessarily. You can have a kind of ideal home <laughs> that's in your in your head or in your heart. Um, so for the first time, Ryu found he could give a name to the family likeness. Uh, I think that's a misprint. <laughs> I should say that for several months he had detected in the faces in the streets. He had only to look around him now at the end of the plague with its misery and privations. These men and women had come to wear the aspect of the part they had been playing for so long, the part of emigrants whose faces first and now their clothes told of long banishment from a distant homeland. Remember when we talked about how uh, one of the major differences for us, aside from the fact that our plague is not nearly as severe and fatal and terrible as this one, yeah. but one other difference is that ours is global and theirs is in one town. So they have, you know, uh, a real kind of exile from the, literally the space beyond the gates of Oran. But for us, <laughs> <laughs> our exile is from or was let's say when we were in lockdown I mean things are kind of loosening up for better or worse um, that we're kind of exiled we were kind of exiled from just like the concept of there being social circumstances and civilization it's almost like an exile from an ideal uh, do, do you understand like the world <laughs> as it exists ideally somewhere in the background of your mind, uh, you have this, I don't know, world.exe running always in the background. <laughs> yeah. um, that, that you're exiled from. Maybe it's the, maybe the gates of Oran for us at that time would be represented by the front door to your house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, among the heaps of corpses, the clanging of bells and ambulances, the warnings of what goes by the name of fate, among unremitting waves of fear and agonized revolt, the horror that such things could be, always a great voice had been ringing in the ears of these forlorn, panicked people, <clears throat> a voice calling them back to the land of their desire, a homeland. Um, and yeah, he goes on to say that it's, I guess to make it a little bit more poetic, but also clearer. Um, it lay outside the walls of the stifled, strangled town, in the brushwood of the hills, in the waves of the sea, under free skies, and in the custody of love. So those are the homeland. It was to this, their lost home, toward happiness, they longed to return, turning their backs disgustedly on all else. As to what the exile and that longing for reunion meant, Ryu had no idea. That, that's, that's him as usual. <laughs> What all this means, if you were to ask him, he would say, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> That's the thing about Ryu. He, he doesn't know, but he knows. <laughs> he knows without knowing. Um, as he walked ahead, jostled on all sides, accosted now and then, and gradually made his way into the less crowded streets, he was thinking uh, it has no importance whether such things have a meaning or have not a meaning. So that's, again, he has a very cold view, a very calculating, let's say, material view, but not totally. Uh, he, you know, for example, appreciates Rambert's effort to find happiness in love, um, but he's, he can't himself see the world that way. Um, 
he really takes this uh, it's not important whether there's meaning there stance to the extreme. All we need to consider is the answer given to men's hope. Uh, he continues to ruminate, to think. He comments on the desires of those held in exile, uh, those who long simply for the reunion with their beloved. Those who clinging to their little own had set their hearts solely on returning to the home of their love <clears throat> had sometimes their reward, though some of them were still walking the streets alone without the one they waited. Others like Rambert, <clears throat> to whom the doctor had said early that morning, courage, it's up to you now to prove you're right. Had without faltering welcomed back the loved one who they thought was lost to them. And for some time, anyhow, they would be happy. But they knew now that if there is one thing you can, one can always uh, yearn for and sometimes attain, it's human love. So here is a kind of answer to the absurdity question. Uh, humans can yearn for and can sometimes get love between each other. Uh, it's not like the weather. <laughs> Ryu understands his position fighting against nature as an endless battle that can never have a final victory. Uh, but love is something that people can realistically attain among themselves. So it's something that's in the human domain. Uh, there are others who have larger, quote unquote, larger goals. For example, Taru. Uh, who wanted to get to the heart of, I mean, he already, Teru already believes he understands the world, but he still is searching for something, some kind of answer. He wants to find out, for example, what it means to be a secular saint. Um, but for those who had aspired beyond and above the human individual towards something they could not even imagine, so that would be Teru, there had been no answer perhaps for Panelu. <laughs> Teru might seem to have won through that hardly come by peace of which he used to speak, but he had found in it, had found it only in death, too late to turn it to account. So yeah, it is a kind of, <laughs> you have found the truth, but you are no longer capable of understanding it because you are no longer with us. Um, both of these and others would consider when I say both of these, when I say both of these, uh, Sartre, Camus, and Simone de Beauvoir might say that uh, going to religion, in a way, you uh, solve the problem, but you become an object because now you have that. Uh, you have that printed instruction inside of you that explains why you do the things that you do. Um, so you become sort of the object of those instructions. Uh, you get pushed around in the world the same way that the weather pushes you around. Um, and the other answer is something like <laughs> suicide, <laughs> which also makes you into an object quite literally. Um, Taru and Panelu are also paralleled in that way. Do you guys understand what I mean by that? Uh, yes. I would say. It's a, do you remember the Robot Bully comic? Why did you do that? Robot Bully says, I will print you a report. <laughs> Prints <laughs> something out. Yeah. And the other robot reads it and says, huh, interesting. So <laughs> I know exactly why you did what you did that it's kind of like robot bullies religion is right inside of him written in the circuit boards and he can print it out for you. And there's no mystery there. There's no free will actually in a way. <laughs> uh, that's also Sartre's bad faith. Bad faith is you're saying I did that because I am blah, blah, blah. I did that because I am, I did that because I'm an American. I did that because, because I'm a Christian, because I'm a man. All these things are ways of explaining away your, your freedom. Ironically enough, because the 
America guy would be probably also screaming the, the word freedom. <laughs> freedom. Um, that's precisely the opposite. You're, you're saying all of these things are just, you know, printed in the world and they decide the way that I should behave. Uh, and I just react to them. That's it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, at this point, Ryu tells us, I indeed am the narrator. Um, he takes a walk toward Granz and Katard's place, and he tells us, it bears mentioning the fate of old Katard. Uh, so Katard is the contrast to all of these fellows, as we have repeatedly discussed. Katard is someone who thrives in the plague, someone who doesn't want it to end. And you can't think either that it's just because he's making money. That I don't think that's the explanation at all. He has, he's crazy, I would say. Sure, but to put yeah. a finer point on it, uh, it's easy to crazy say. Crazy situation suits him. Crazy situation absolutely suits him. Yeah. Um, but he feels at home. Uh, he's a really interesting character for all of his faults because he feels at home in all this chaos. Um, he feels belonging. It's not just that he's making money. Uh, yeah. He could feel belonging by joining the sanitary squads though. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just not in him. He's expressed, uh, I didn't put the quote as an ignorant heart. Uh, something like that, self-centered. Um, I mean, his initial act in the book is to attempt to kill himself, which is the ultimate self-centered behavior. <laughs> yeah. It's the ultimately selfish act. Everyone else has to live with your decision uh, after that. You do not have to live with that decision because it's done for you. It's a big clue about his person. Um, so yeah, Ryu's headed back over to that side of town and he comes up against a wall of police. Sorry, doctor, a policeman says, I can't let you through. There's a crazy fellow with a gun shooting at everybody, but you'd better stay. We may need you. Uh, there's something else I didn't put in here that when he looks over, there's a, you know, this standoff happening and there's a dog that somebody has apparently kept hidden because there was the sort of dog uh, purge, <laughs> dog and cat purge earlier in the book. Um, but somebody kept their dog hidden in their house, must have, because there's a dog. And Katard just shoots the dog. Um, <laughs> it's a, by the way, it's a rule in cinema <laughs> that if you're cruel to an animal, you're just automatically the, you know, one of the bad guys. Um, but uh, Katard is like that dog, though. The dog was kept hidden. <laughs> uh, it's kind of how Katard was when he was hiding from the world. Um, in any case, they have to bring in to, uh, they have to bring in the heavy guns. They have to go get the big machine guns to get Katard out of there. Um, and they describe this process. The cars pull up. He sees some police sneak off into the opposite building carrying large bundles covered in oil cloth. Presumably those are the parts for the heavy machine gun. Um, and then they begin gunning the window while some other police sneak in through the door and uh, they grab him and start dragging him out. He's also struggling in the same way that the plague victims struggle when they're on their beds, is writhing around and screaming. <clears throat> I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> I haven't thought about it all the way. It's just an observation. Um, so yeah, he gets arrested. That's the thing, you know, the more you think about Katard, he could find a sort of belonging in prison he probably will <laughs> have you guys ever seen the movie papillon it's like a classic uh prison movie from the 1960s I uh, 
It's a good movie. They remade it recently with uh, what's his name, Rami Malek. I always get his name confused. They yeah, they remade it in 2018, but the original is great. Anyway, if you ever get a chance, watch it. It's about a French prison colony uh, that Papillon, the, the main character, escapes from. But there is a kind of <clears throat> life there. Actually, that came up in this book uh, when they mentioned that uh, there's a prison community. Do you remember there's the community of monks and nuns, communities of monks and nuns, but also the prisoners and the guards represent a community as well. Um, and, you know, Qatard could go be a part of that community. He would certainly find some kind of belonging. I mean, sure, he would have to go through a bunch of terrible things just at first. But once he got settled in, he'd make some friends and he'd be okay, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. I guess uh, maybe the prisons are really, really horrible. Um, actually, he would probably be going to that same prison colony that, that Papillon went to because I'm pretty sure it was in Algeria. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, by the way, Papillon, I can't remember his real name. Uh, uh, never mind, it doesn't matter. The guy who wrote it uh, was actually an escapee from a French penal colony. Uh, and he says that his stories are largely true, somewhat exaggerated sometimes, but some of the stories are stories of other prisoners that he knew and became friends with that he incorporated into his own. But he just kind of, you know, says that. He was sort of persona non grata in France for a long time. <laughs> um, I mean, naturally, he escaped from a prison colony. It's worth looking into anyway. Um, He's called Papillon because of a big butterfly tattoo that he has. Papillon is butterfly in French. Uh, so that's what happens to Qatar. That's the end of Qatar's story. Uh, he's off to, to hang out with Papillon. <laughs> Grand, on the other hand, has really sort of lightened up. He has written to his wife and he's back at his old sentence. You kind of get the impression that he might make more progress this time you know it doesn't say that directly but he really seems to be uh doing much better i mean he did practically he was on death's doorstep oh look on his doorstep <laughs> i don't know if that just happened by accident uh, on his doorstep <laughs> grand bade the doctor good night he was going to put it in evening's work that always kind of makes me chuckle an evening's work on the sentence <laughs> a whole evening he said. Uh, just as he was starting up the stairs, he added that he'd written to Jean and was feeling much happier. Also, he'd made a fresh start with his phrase, I've cut out all the adjectives. <laughs> that's, remember, that's what I said. That's what you do. You cut out all the adjectives. Uh, then see where you stand. Try maybe, I don't know, second sentence. That works too. Um, then we get one last meeting with the asthmatic Spaniard. So I alluded to this earlier. Um, he, asks, he asks what happened to Taru because he had started to really like Taru. Taru was always making the rounds with Ryu. Uh, so the asthmatic Spaniard, who's never named, really seems like he should have a name. Uh, I mean, he makes enough appearances, we should learn his name. <laughs> I guess it's intentional, though. We're not meant to know his name. He's a chaotic element. He's like the weather. He doesn't have a name. <laughs> I mean, he's not chaotic, actually. He's systematic, but his, his system is, is absurd. So he's not absurd in the same way that the weather is. Or is he? Anyway, inquiring after Taru, or when he hears about Taru's end, Yes, the old man said after a moment's silence, it's always the best who go. That's how life is. But he was a man who knew what he wanted. Why do you say that, says Ryu. Oh, no particular reason, only, well, he never talked just for talking's sake. I'd rather cottoned to him. By the way, that means I'd rather, I'd rather taken a liking to him. But there you all are. Uh, all those folks are saying, it was plague. We had the plague here. You'd almost think they expected to be given medals for it. 
But what does that mean, plague? Just life, no more than that. So there it is. Uh, this is just direct acknowledgement. We all live in the plague. We have the plague. Also, remember Taru kind of realized that he was a part of the plague if he supports the system that puts people to death and he has to resist the system itself. So he became an agitator. Uh, don't worry about me, doctor. There's lots of life in me yet. I'll see them all into their graves. I know how to live. <laughs> he knows how to live. What does that mean? He knows how to count peas <laughs> and put them into different pans to tell him when to eat. So <laughs> when hungry, eat your rice, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. He maybe has the secret. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, they talk about, oh, this is supposed to be in italics. They talk about there being a monument erected to the victims of the plague. The Spaniard says, I could have sworn it and there'll be speeches. He chuckled throatily. I can almost hear them saying, our dear departed, and then they'll go off and have a good snack. He's very cynical about these people's feelings on the whole thing, but he's also kind of right in the sense that people want to forget about the plague. They're going to go to the monument and that ritual will be to say goodbye <laughs> so they can then go off and have a good snack. So it's not entirely cynical. It's also true. People need ways of letting go. Um, he heads up onto the terrace. This is the terrace where Taru uh, and he bonded and Taru told the story of his childhood. Uh, <clears throat> he looks out over the town uh, it was in the midst of shouts rolling against the terrace wall in massive waves that waxed. Waxed here <clears throat> means grew, if you haven't heard this use of wax as a verb. Waxing and waning means growing and shrinking. <clears throat> waxed in volume and duration. While cataracts of colored fire, fire fell thicker through the darkness, that Ryu resolved to compile this chronicle. <clears throat> so he should not be one of those who hold their peace, but bear witness in favor of those plague-stricken people so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure. And to state quite simply that we learn in a lifetime of pestilence or in a time of pestilence. And this is the important part of this quote. Uh, there are more things to admire in men than to despise. So in spite of everything, Ryu is an optimist. Ryu believes in people. Um, that's why he holds Grand in such regard. Is it, it's because Grand is an ordinary man, uh, and you know gave in to his better angels to to resist the plague and do what needed to be done. I won't. I won't say to do what's right. I think that I think that Ryu would not agree with that that framing, do what's right. No, do what's necessary. Uh, all of this writing and wronging labeling is kind of counterproductive. We can say what's necessary and what's unnecessary. Some might argue that's the same thing, but that's another discussion. Maybe. Um, and indeed, as he listens, listen to the cries of joy rising from the town. So we have to remember, you know, he's a scientist. Uh, the way he sees the world, when he looks at a pile of linens, <laughs> he sees the potential for the plague. <laughs> Ryu remembered that such joy is always imperiled, so endangered. He knows, or he knew what those jubilant crowds did not know but could have learned from books. Mm -hmm. That the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good. It can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chests. It bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves. And perhaps the day would come when, for the bane and enlightening, uh, so for the uh, harm and uh, revulsion, destruction, and enlightening of men, it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. That's the last line. Yeah, very encouraging. Kind of. Sorry? Very encouraging, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, ironically. Right. Well, I mean, it, it, it's both, though, because he is yeah. still optimistic. Yeah, he is optimistic, but he says, 
that uh, it can come, you know, anytime. Right. And here's yeah. the, this is an interesting problem, too, when we think about this in relation to the Nazis. Um, yeah, it can it, appear all. Okay. Right, but it's it's too much, perhaps too much to say that, well, you know, Nazis are just like the weather. <laughs> Sometimes you get Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're watching the weather report and the the, the, the weatherman says, well, we're going to have Nazis tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so there's a bit of a problem there. And that's one of the things that he was criticized over in this book is that it kind of elides. It kind of covers up the responsibility that Germans had in making the decisions, the decisions that they did. But I mean, I think that still can be explained even within the framework of existentialism, where it's a kind of bad faith and the bad ideologies are kind of slowly built up in order for people to, uh, like people are, people find reasons to be awful to each other. Uh, and those reasons, some of them get struck down and others, they mutate and evolve. And there's a kind of, natural selection of ideas to that that compel people to be to be cruel to each other to murder each other uh and so you wind up with highly evolved selected ideas and reasons why people should be cruel to each other um and that's what the plague bacillus is <laughs> these bad ideologies that are able to survive as they do. As the plague. As the plague or as... Bad cellos. Or as bad ideologies. Yeah. Bad ideas. And again, it's, it's you know, it is a conundrum. Our, uh, people choose to follow ideas. People don't choose to be bitten by fleas. <laughs> yeah. But um, we're going to talk about that more next time, I think. I'd like to uh, actually try to dig up. I, I can't remember exactly uh, Camus' response to Simone de Beauvoir on her criticism. I'd like to get it right. I'm going to search that down and we'll talk about it, among other things. So, yes, that's it for now. Next time, we are going to talk about, well just related themes um we're going to talk still a bit about the plague but uh if there's anything that you guys would like to include in the conversation let me know um i'm thinking about including a couple of little tidbits from kurt vonnegut i mentioned that before um he's a he's another writer he's an american uh fiction writer he he writes uh sort of philosophical science fiction well not just science fiction it's weird it's fun and strange writing um but he also he has a lot of similar themes as you'll see we're going to talk a little bit about some of his stories next time just to draw parallels i mean there are plenty of other writers who deal in the themes of uh uh what motivates people you know what makes a human a human um so if there's something you in particular would like to talk about, just let me know. Um, yeah, and you, you guys won't have to read a lot for me to, to present to you a couple of ideas. So for example, in some of Kurt Vonnegut's books, he has another author who's in several of his books. So a character in several of his books is another author called Kilgore Trout. And you always hear about the other author's stories in very short form. So a character in a Kurt Vonnegut book will say, I read this crazy story by a guy named Kilgore Trout. And you get the whole story right there in one paragraph. <laughs> yeah. You'll see what I mean. Okay. That's it for now. Um, I hope you guys will join me next week yes. for a bit more of a relaxed and casual session and discussion about related themes so next time it's just about topics from book and yeah i mean you know we, 
we we want to stick with stick with the themes um we could also extend that to to film or even i don't know music i don't know <laughs> if you guys okay. can think of a song that's related yeah. <laughs> or paintings anything visual art whatever you like but we do want to stick with the theme maybe we should also talk about uh, Gernika, Pablo uh, Picasso's. Uh, oh, know, Gernika, yeah, sure. Yeah, because it's also about war and, I don't know, about yeah. cr crazy situations. Yeah, and he was also in the resistance, as you guys saw in the yeah. first session. Yeah. Hanging out with Camus and everybody else. Okay, yeah. guys, well, that's it for now. Uh, okay. Just let me know if you have any questions and uh, I'll see you next time. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.